happening and it's technology's promise with uh, Stanley Whittingham. I would love for Stanley Whittingham to join me on the screen, as well as the three provocateurs, Ahmad, great name, Beatty, and David. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, can we get seven minutes on the clock, please? Thank you, the seven minutes. And Stanley, your dialogue starts right now. Okay, thank you. Um... As the Nobel Committee pointed out, I think some 15 months ago, they said they have laid the foundation for a fossil fuel society. Now, the technologies and the tools are there. We can solve the problem, at least mitigate climate change. And particularly, uh, people talk about climate war warming. It's really, I call it climate messing up. We get extremes on both ends. And if we really mess up the climate, woe betide, I would say, London and Northern Europe. People don't remember London's as far north as the Hudson Bay. So if the Gulf Stream should shift, they've got real issues in Europe. So um, other key thing about um, the technologies we have, they can help the global warming issue, but they can also improve our resilience to natural disasters whether they're hurricanes in New York City or in the south of the states, or whether they're forest fires in Australia or California. If we have good technology in place, we don't rely necessarily on the grid alone. On fossil fuels, we'll be in a better shape. And the bottom line is really um, renewable energy is viable. It's economically competitive with coal and um, oil and natural gas. Um, really, the big issue with um, renewable energy, it is intermittent. So the sun shines when it wants to. The wind only blows at certain times of the day and most predominantly at nighttime. So we have to have storage of some sort. And the predominant storage, certainly season to season, is pumped hydro. But I don't see any more of that happening in North America. No, the environmentalists don't really like us building big ponds. So the, the only really viable method is batteries of one sort or another. They are ready. They are you know, available now. And probably most of you know, the largest facility in the world started up in Moss Landing, California, about middle of December, 1.2 gigawatt hours of batteries. And they have the okay to go to six gigawatt hours. So we have the technology there. We can do it. The, the real issue are twofold. Batteries are not really sustainable today. It takes 60 to 80 kilowatt hours of energy to generate one kilowatt hour of a lithium ion battery. So we, we have to improve that. And one, one way of doing that is to have a much more localized um, supply chain. Right now, if you look at some of the elements like nickel, it may go around the world two or three times before it gets into your battery, whether it's for an electric vehicle or for, for grid storage. So we really have to solve that one. And what this means is we need what I would call regional supply chains. In the case of... Um, Europe, they're investing billions of dollars to get a supply chain where the raw materials will come from Scandinavia. They'll be processed in Scandinavia using hydro energy, so very clean energy. Those final products will then get shipped, say, Germany for the auto companies. We have to do the same thing in North America. I emphasize the word North because the United States cannot do it alone. We have to work with Canada and with Mexico. Canada has a lot of minerals we don't have. Canada also has the clean hydropower in Quebec province. And I'm sure they'll be excited to join with us. We have to get the governments to work together to um, get all their efforts in one place. But no, we have the technical solutions in place. But we now have to get the politicians and public on board. Without the politicians agreeing, 
without the public saying, yes, we need renewable energy, we need clean energy, and I, we're not going to invoke NIMBY, like I think the folks on Long Island are trying to do now to stop um, wind power being put offshore there. We have to put the really the, the source of the energy we need, where it's going to be used, wherever practical, and not ship it all around the, the country. So I think that we have to address that. Um, and really, in the end, it's our job to educate the population and the politicians to get them on board. Um, also, it's important to say we cannot do this alone. So if you looked at when we got the Nobel Prize, there were three of us. I was a chemist. John Goodenough was a physicist. Akira Yoshino was an engineer. It took three disciplines working together at different stages of the invention. It also took three countries. And I think most people don't realize that um, I made my inventions in the United States, even though I'm British. John Gordonough is born in Germany, but he's an American, but he made his inventions in England. And Okiro Yoshino is Japanese, and he was the engineer working in the company who could bring the, the best to fruition, but also involved heavy investment. In this case, it was Sony. But if we're talking about renewable energy, we're talking about the federal governments of the US and Canada needs to invest so we can compete with the rest of the world. We cannot rely on one country to supply all our batteries and in fact, all our electric vehicles, which is their goal. So we cannot stay alone. We um, must cooperate around the world, pull all together in one place and I say, get all the politicians behind us, um, use all the resources we have to move forward. And I'm hoping that our present government is going to do that and without too much interference from the naysayers who don't believe in facts and don't believe in science. We have to believe in our science and move on from there. Thank you. Amen to that for sure. Seven minutes for our provocateurs. Um, whoever has a question first, just throw up a hand. I'm gonna go right on you. Let's get right into it. Seven minutes on the clock. Provocateurs start now. Who wants to go first for Mr. Stanley Whittingham? Don't everybody jump at once because I'll go because I can talk forever. <laughs> oh, I, on I will. Didi, go ahead, please. Thanks so much, Stan. It's it's wonderful wonderful to be having this conversation. Um, and everything that you shared makes so much sense. I think that because we're talking about something that is so complex and micro, and there isn't a one size fits all solution, just given the the breadth and and you know number of people tuning into this incredible summit, what would be your one takeaway? You know, the essence of your learning over all the decades that you've been working in this area. Thank you to a similar Anglo-American to me, I guess. <laughs> um, Absolutely. I think the message is we can do it if we want to do it. As um, I think Bill Gates said, um, the pandemic we in right now, everybody can see the impact of that. Climate change, yeah. much longer term. And we really have to recognize we have to do things now. So I think the take home message I say is we can do it. We should do it and don't let others get in our way of doing it. Absolutely. Ahmad. Yeah, um, thanks for the uh, speech, Sammy. Amazing. Uh, I just had a question um, coming like more from my context as a youth leader, as in a young person. You've touched upon education, and I was wondering, how could you uh, connect between um, the kind of transformation you've been uh, pointing out and the youth uh, and the youth in general and the world? How could we connect um, make the youth work together with such uh, movements around the world, especially with the education field. I think the young lady from Sweden told us how to do that. So I think, no, the youth has to speak out. When I came to the United States, it was the middle of what we, some people would call flower power. It was also the middle of the Vietnam War. And everybody, the youth in college and high schools were all speaking out. They seem to have gone very quiet in the last 10 years. You know, they're mute on these issues. 
we have to encourage them to get up and speak out because old folks will say, well, it's not going to happen in my time. It's not going to affect me. But you no, know, if you're 20 years old, it can affect you and, and it could affect you in a big way. David. Well, uh, Stanley, that was an, a very impressive uh, discussion of battery technology, which obviously will play a big role in, in renewable energies. But um, there's still a long way to go. I mean, electricity, the electricity grid is only part of the problem. Uh, can batteries power airplanes? Little airplanes. No, I, I'm pragmatic. <laughs> We're never Very going little. to get rid. Yes. They're going to do little hops from island to island, and they're going to be unmanned, I suspect. Whereas you, you fly, you won't have a pilot with you. It'll be like a big drone you don't want to carry that dead weight. So one question I, I have, uh, so I'm a theor theoretical physicist who's very far away from techno technological innovation, but, uh, but I'm wondering about the development of technology, um, which isn't directly part of, you know, multinational company strategies. So the batteries, Tesla played a big role in promoting battery usage and other big companies. But what about something like technological mitigation uh, or uh, geoclimate engineering, which are not part of any companies, you know, multinational corporations' plans at the moment? What, what can spur technological developments that are outside current big companies' plans? That's a really good question. I would love to jump on that question as well. How do we incentivize just people to look at technology as advancing us on the earth and not have a profit motive behind it, right? Not have anything to gain from it other than the advancement of us as a species. Exactly. My concern, I'm not sure the U.S. is set up to do that. U.S. is set up on the profit motive. Um, now, my early days, I worked for an oil company called Exxon. They were going to become right. a big energy company and they were going to build electric vehicles. They were the largest manufacturer of solar photovoltaic cells in the United States in the 1970s. Most people don't realize that. They also had the world's experts on climate change and they freely published that work. Hmm. So I think the, the big issue is no, we invented batteries. The U.S. Stop. invented a lot of things, and they all went to Asia to get commercialized because the U.S. companies couldn't see where they could make a profit. That's so right. the real question is how do we move technology ahead without that profit motive there? And you know, Can the government step in? I don't know. But if, if somebody doesn't step in, China's going to own the electric vehicle market, therefore the grid market, and I should say in New York State, it's a British company and a Spanish company that owns more than half the grid. Hmm. So the foreigners are stepping in and now somehow we've got to incentivize American companies to do it. Absolutely. Bidi, I'm on. Any more for Stanley? Yeah. I, Bidi, I, so I think I'm just conscious of, of the time. I think, um, you know, realizing that technology has really fast tracked a lot of what it means to be human without reflecting the true cost or value in the process. How do we start reflecting those real costs going forward and learning from our mistakes in the past? Fantastic question. Well, I think there's no penalty today in the United States to speak of for generating carbon dioxide. And obviously we have to rectify that and change it, but it's very difficult to estimate what technical progress is going to be. When I started out, we didn't have computers and students don't realize that. If I show them a slide rule, they don't know what it is. Hmm. If I show them a log table, they have no idea what it is. So things change rapidly. We can try to predict, but in the end, we never predict as much as things change. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Stanley, for that conversation. Thank you to the provocateurs, Ahmad, Beatty, David. Fantastic talk, fantastic um, 
dialogue, I think technology's promise is something that we are all, um, that we all need to hold to account. We all need to make sure that that promise from technology is sustainable for all of us. Thank you guys so very much. Really, really appreciate this conversation.